Good morning, good afternoon to all of you. Welcome to this webinar on climate change negotiations and health organized by WHO, the World Health Organization, UNITAR, the United Nations Institute for Training and Research, and UNCC LEARN, the One UN Climate Change Learning Partnership. Many thanks for participating in this event. My name is Cristina Recacavas. I work as a Green Development and Climate Change Specialist at UNITAR, and I'm the coordinator of the UNCC LEARN program. I have the pleasure of moderating today's webinar. To officially open the webinar, I would like to invite Ms. Marina Mayero, Technical Officer on Climate Change and Health from WHO, to deliver welcome remarks. Thank you, Christina, and welcome to everybody. So great to see so many joining still while we are giving these welcoming remarks. Um, as, as Christina mentioned, I'm from the World Health Organization, I'm working with the climate change and health team. Marina, sorry, we cannot hear you. You are muted somehow. Can you hear me now? Now, yes, I'm sorry for that. So, Christina, I was just saying while I was muted that we are so glad uh, to, 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 to organize together with UNITAR and the UNCC LEARN team this important webinar just before, a few, few weeks before the COP27. Uh, as uh, Christina mentioned, I work for the World Health Organization in the climate change and health team working on partnership and advocacy. But very lucky also to have in this call with me several um, uh, colleagues from the climate change and health team that will share with you some of the key information, key message and important uh, uh, um, activities that WHO is implementing uh, to try to raise the voice of the health community and to bring the health message to the COP. And you will hear more from us later during course why for us it's so important to put health at the center of the climate change negotiations and for us the partnership with UNITAR uh, is, is, is fundamental uh, since two years we're experiencing uh, this uh, a nice collaboration to bring together the negotiations wisdom and the knowledge from UNITAR together with the key messaging from the health community uh, led by WHO to the to the COP. So I would, don't want to further you with the welcoming. I see many people are still <laughs> joining. This is very, very uh, uh, um, rewarding. And we're looking forward to speak to you, to give us, uh, give you our information, to hear from you, your question and interest. And um, while well, we'll talk more later, so just want to close here by welcoming again and welcome welcome to all of you still joining while we are speaking back to you christina thank you marina for your kind words and for framing uh, the webinar so nicely now mr angus mckay director of the division for planet at unitar and the head of the usc Ceylon secretariat will deliver opening remarks on behalf of unitar thank you so much uh, Christina and Marina, I must apologize for, I don't know if you can all hear dings and dongs and things going on. Unfortunately, this is what happens at the beginning um, of these events. Uh, so I see a lot of people joining. Uh, so I guess we take that as, as a good thing. Uh, so yes, absolutely delighted that this webinar is, is going ahead. A very warm welcome to you all from UNITAR, we're based in Geneva and the UN CC Learn Partnership. And UN Climate Change Learn, CC Learn, is a global one UN initiative, which is hosted by UNITAR, and it was established about 10 years ago. And the idea was to provide a single entry point into the UN system for training on climate change. Mindful as we are for everyone around the world, that the UN is a quite a complex set of organizations and it's quite sometimes quite hard to find your way through to the best knowledge um, and skills that are available so who is a very long-standing uh, member of the partnership and therefore we always happy to to work and team up with who and i'm delighted that this topic of climate change and health is getting increasing traction uh globally um uh, and that we've been able to update the course in particular uh, with support from WHO. 
I'm also delighted that Marcelo Rocha is here with us today as one of our experts to help to demystify for you the climate convention, how it works, and also where the best entry points might be with regard to human health. So Marcelo also welcome, and um, I know we work with you quite a bit uh, in different and various ways, and we're, we're, it's, it's great that uh, you've been able to, you're gonna be making a contribution today. Because it's vital, ladies and gentlemen, that all parties to the convention and to the Paris Agreement have the knowledge and skills to be able to push forward this important agenda, and particularly as it relates to adaptation uh, and, of course, the lives and livelihoods of vulnerable people. And we already know the very multiple ways in which human health is being affected by climate change, both directly, for example, through flooding uh, or heat waves, as we've been experiencing this year, or indeed indirectly, through the impacts that climate change has on, on na national budgetary allocations and resources. Uh, now, the online course uh, provides a very useful summary of all of these effects, and I very much encourage you to complete it if you haven't already done so. Um, and just to say in closing, uh, in general, we find that uh, this combination of online self-paced uh, learning through the online course um, combined with a with real time webinars like this is quite a nice way of extending uh, and broadening your learning experience. So it should help you to consolidate your knowledge and also to to build the the personal confidence, um, which is always necessary as a precursor to taking action. Because why would we do uh, this learning if we weren't intending to take action in our lives and in our professions. So I very much hope that you find this format today engaging and useful. If you do, please give us a thumbs up. And if not, then we'd be very happy to get your suggestions on how it could be done better in the future so that we could all improve together. Thanks again to our colleagues and friends at WHO. And thanks for listening. I hope you enjoy the seminar. Back to you, Christina. Thank you. Thank you very much, Angus. Um, thank you for highlighting uh, the importance of climate change education and training um, to support the climate action. I see we are now 300 participants in this uh, meeting room, which is the maximum capacity we can have. So thank you again for your interest. At this point, uh, Let's have a look at the objectives for today's webinar. As you may have seen in the invitation, there are three main objectives. First of all, we would like to present the newly updated e-learning course on climate change negotiations and health, which has just been relaunched on the UNCC Learn website. Secondly, we would like to provide an overview of recent climate change negotiations and the key milestones with a particular focus on health, of course. And thirdly, the event aims to highlight uh, the health priorities for COP27 and the participation of the health community in this event. With regard to the agenda, after this uh, welcome and introduction segment, we will provide you with an overview of the course and uh, a first uh, segment focusing on the climate change negotiation and health. Then we will have uh, the opportunity to open the floor for a Q&A with the expert. This will be followed by a second uh, uh, presentation on the health priorities for COP27 delivered by uh, our WHO colleagues, followed again by an opportunity for you to ask questions and interact with the experts. We will then uh, summarize key messages, wrap up and conclude. With regard to the online etiquette, I'm sure you're very familiar with the uh, guidelines on screen. First of all, we encourage you to keep your camera on at all time to facilitate the interaction, uh, if possible at all. We would like to ask you to mute your microphone when you are not speaking and to raise your hand through the dedicated Zoom function if you would like to speak. You're also most welcome to use the chat uh, and to use uh, the um, uh, reaction features on Zoom. Please note that this event is being recorded and is also currently uh, live streamed on the UNITAR YouTube account. Should you encounter any technical issues, please contact my colleague Julia Villalba 
through the private chat here on Zoom or via email at the email address that you can see on screen and will be shortly shared also via the chat. Great. Before zooming into the content, we would like to get a sense of who is with us today, who you are. And to do so, we would like to invite you to participate in a short poll. So uh, please answer, please select the answer that is relevant to you in the pop-up boxes that will appear on screen. I believe you can now see the first question. Yes, which region are you from? Do let us know. Great, I see already 170 answers. Few seconds still, almost 300 answers. Great, I see that uh, we have more or less the same number of participants from Africa and Asia Pacific, followed by Europe, and then Latin America and North America. Great, really a uh, wide representation. Excellent. We can now run the second question, which refers to your background or expertise. So what is your background? It's health, environment, climate change, or uh, diplomacy. Are you part of the diplomatic community? Or some other background? Excellent, over 200 answers already. I can see in this case that we have a, a diverse background with environment being perhaps, yes, being the most represented sector um, in the group, followed by other. And we encourage you to share in the chat what sector or background you have. And then health, we also have a quite significant uh, health representation, health sector representation, followed by diplomacy in the end. Great. At this point, we can launch our third question, which refers to your experience with climate change diplomacy and in particular your participation at COP. Have you attended COP before? And if yes, how many times? Okay, it seems that the majority of you has never attended COP, but answer is still coming in. So we can close. Uh, perhaps now. Okay. As you can see, the majority, almost 200 participants in this uh, meeting have never attended COP. And then 15% uh, have actually attended one to three times a COP. And then only 3% of the participants have attended more than three times. Okay, perfect. We hope that this discussion will help you better understand how the climate change negotiations work. And finally, the last question. Will you attend COP27 in Egypt in November? Excellent, the answer is coming in. Okay, I can see that the majority of you, uh, over 70% do not plan to attend COP this time, but uh, almost 30% actually will. Again, a diverse uh, background and experiences. Perfect, thank you so much for participating in our poll. We can now move uh, to our next segment. So here, as mentioned, uh, we are delighted to introduce to you the newly updated e-learning course on climate change negotiations and health. <laughs> the course was launched last year in the lead up to COP26 and it has been updated this year to take into account the results from that conference, as well as key issues to be considered at COP27. 
This course is free, self-paced, and can be taken at any time. It is available in English and takes around three hours to complete. It primarily targets delegates attending the Conference of the Parties to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, so the COPs, and those participating in climate diplomacy. However, it also provides valuable insights for professionals involved in the development and implementation of climate change and health policies. policies. In addition, it could be very relevant to academics and any other individuals interested in addressing health within climate change. The overall objective of the course is to support participants in addressing health within climate change diplomacy and national policy processes, as well as in considering climate change in health policies. You can see here on screen the specific learning objectives, which highlight what participants will be able to do at the end of the course. And these include being able to explain how climate change affects health, recognize the international climate change policy framework, identify the parties and groups of parties to the Convention on Climate Change, the Kyoto Protocol and the Paris Agreement, including the respect, respective commitments and negotiation positions, describe the outcomes of past ne uh, negotiation sessions, and discuss key issues in ongoing international climate change negotiations, uh, particularly with regard to health and health priorities. The course includes six self-standing lessons with different activities, exercises, case studies, videos, and many uh, links to additional resources for in-depth um, and more specific information. These lessons are lesson one, introduction to health and climate change, which focuses on this nexus, presents the health risks that are arising from climate change, their impacts across different communities, impossible health responses to climate change. The second lesson, history of the UN climate negotiations, explore the key milestones in the history of climate diplomacy, focusing on the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the Kyoto Protocol, and the Cancun Agreement. Lesson three, the Paris Agreement, discusses the objectives, key aspects, and main provision of such agreements and introduces the purpose and mechanisms of the NDCs, the National Determined Contributions. Lesson four, from Paris to Glasgow, highlights the key outcomes of COP25, which was held uh, in um, uh, Madrid in 2019, and the key topics discussed in Glasgow at COP26 last year. Lesson five is the newly overhauled um, lesson, that has been completely updated to highlight uh, key priorities for COP27 negotiations, but it also includes WHO's recommendations and priorities for action and how to build uh, climate resilient and low carbon sustainable health systems. Lesson six, the final one, healthy and green recovery for COVID-19, focuses on the impact of the pandemic on our health and our societies and introduces the six prescriptions in the WHO manifesto for a healthy recovery from COVID-19, including practical steps for implementation. All these lessons can be downloaded in PDF format for offline study. And um, a certificate of completion is awarded to those participants that successfully complete the final quiz. The course is available as mentioned on the UCC e-learning platform and the link will be shared here in the chat and is also available at the end of this presentation. Please feel free to register and to disseminate it widely. During this webinar, we'll have the possibility to complement the content of the course and go deeper into selected issues raised. To do so, I would like at this point to invite Mr. Marcelo Rocha to provide complementary information with regard to the climate change negotiations, the latest developments and milestones. Marcelo has a PhD in applied economy from the University of Sao Paulo and has a long-standing experience as advisor to the Brazilian delegation to the UNFCCC, Kyoto Protocol and Paris Agreement, 
and is also a long-standing unit art trainer, among other things. Marcelo, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Christina. Uh, just confirm that you can hear me, please. Okay, you can hear great. You well. Thank you, thank you. And, and thank you, UNITAR and WHO, to, to invite me to this very important uh, debate. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and I hope I can share a little bit of my experience in, in climate change negotiation. I'm not a health expert, so I also want to hear and learn from you uh, this very important uh, adaptation priority. Uh, I've been, as I said, uh, involved in this climate change negotiation for, for many years. And during these years, I had uh, the opportunity to collaborate with UNITAR in different training. So once again, thanks for, for this invitation. Uh, I will go for uh, some of aspects of the climate change negotiations. Of course, there is much more information available, particularly in the training modules and lessons. So I encourage you to, to go to those uh, trainings and, and lessons to learn more about climate change and health uh, relationship. Uh, and of course, over there, you also will find links to other materials in the internet. So it's Again, a very important uh, training that is offered by UNITAR, and I encourage you to go through them. The next slide, please, Christina. We will not have time, of course, to go to all the aspects of the negotiations. And uh, so therefore I have choose here some, what I understand is kind of recent important milestones. And I will try to make the connections with adaptation and their uh, also a uh, health priority. So let's start with the Paris Agreement. That is, I think everybody now is know the Paris Agreement, but just to recall, that is an agreement under the United Nations Convention on Climate Change. That means is an agreement between countries, between parties, and was adopted in 2015 during the COP21 that was hosted by uh, France in Paris. This is why we have the name of Paris Agreement. And this agreement is very important because it brings what we call the nationally determined contributions or NDCs. And what are these NDCs? Basically, there are targets, there are goals that parties to the agreement have uh, put forward. They have tell the rest of the countries to say, well, this is my contribution to uh, reduce emissions. This is my uh, mitigation contribution. And we're gonna see that they also had included in the NDC what we call as an adaptation component. So they are always saying, also saying that, okay, beyond mitigation, I also want to adapt to uh, climate change impacts. I have some vulnerabilities here. So it's a very important document that was uh, created under the Paris Agreement and has this very important component that is both the mitigation and the adaptation component uh, to climate change. And as I said, it's something that countries have developed at the national level. So different from the Kyoto Protocol of the past where we had targets that were agreed uh, for developed countries. In the Paris Agreement, uh, all parties, all countries have presented NDC, both developed and developing countries, and they have done this uh, at the national level. So we have not negotiated none of these NDCs. They have bring uh, these by the countries themselves. Another important characteristic of the Paris Agreement that it entered into force quite quickly on 4th of, uh, 4th of November of 2016. Uh, this is uh, very different from the Kyoto Protocol that took eight years to enter into force. The Paris Agreement has entered into force uh, just after the adoption in 2015. And I believe this was due to the fact that the NDCs, again, was uh, developed and agreed at the national level. So countries were very comfortable in adopting the Paris Agreement because they knew what the targets are and they have developed and agreed their own targets. And then uh, in 2018, we had what we may call or some people call the Paris rule book is a, a set of decisions that will now allow us to implement the Paris Agreement and to parties to implement their NDCs. 
if you read the text of the Paris Agreement, of course, uh, we will not find all the details about how to implement the NDCs, how to report information uh, on the NDCs. This has to be developed later in the Paris Rule Book, and that happened in 2018 during COP24 in Katowice, Poland. And more recently, we have also some uh, rules uh, related to the Paris Agreement agreed in Glasgow, COP26, that was just 22 uh, last year. And here I want to highlight uh, the tables or what we call the transparency tables that we're going to be used to report information uh, on the NDCs and also the Article 6 rules. Article 6 are the, is the article of the Paris Agreement that brings the carbon market uh, to the Paris Agreement. So with all these rules, both uh, the Katowice rules and the, Paris, and the Glasgow rules, we have now, I would say, 99% of all the decisions and, and guidance that we need to implement the Paris uh, Agreement. Next one, please. So now it's time, as I said, to implement the NDCs. Uh, the rules are almost complete. There are some minor issues left over to COP27, but uh, we will discuss them later. But for, for now, what we can say is that parties are ready to implement, or of course, uh, many of us are already implementing the NDCs. And they, we are doing two things, the mitigation component, where parties have agreed to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, to remove carbon from the atmosphere, to tackle uh, the emissions of uh, greenhouse gases. And there are different types of NDCs. It's not now the time, or we don't have the, the here in this webinar, the opportunity to go into details, but just to give you an overview, uh, there are different types. 35% of these are what we call absolute emission reduction targets. 43% are deviations from projections of emissions of business as usual, and there are other types as well. But here I want to emphasize, next slide please, in other component of the NDC, that is the adaptation component. And we uh, uh, can see here in this figure that there is uh, in the adaptation component of the NDC, uh, many of the countries, many of the NDC have also identified human health as an adaptation priority. You can see here in, in the figure, uh, almost 70% of the NDCs, uh, when they present the NDC, uh, the adaptation component, they have included in this adaptation component, human health as a adaptation priority. And that makes sense. Uh, we know that the impacts of climate change are already happening. And unfortunately, they are uh, due to climate change uh, impacts in different areas, including in human health. Next one, please. So here, just to highlight a little bit how this has been presented in the NDCs. Uh, once you receive the, the presentation, you can click in the source UNFCCC 2021. It will give uh, go to the document prepared by the UNFCCC secretary that they had made this kind of analysis of all the components of the NDCs, both mitigation and adaptation. And in the document, you will see uh, these paragraphs or these bullet points that I'm highlighting here. I don't want to go into the details now. We can, of course, debate this during the chat or, or the question and answers. Uh, but please uh, take a look on that. Also here, uh, you see this figure is then also a, a link to the WHO uh, document that they have done uh, also a kind of assessment of the NDC uh, from the point of view of health. It's a very important and interesting document. So both the UNCCC Secretariat document and WAO uh, document, I think are good sources to you to understand a little bit more how the adaptation uh, priorities were decided by parties in the NDCs, particularly the health component. Next one, please. So what I want to uh, discuss here is how this uh, health adaptation priority will be treated in what we call the enhanced transparency framework of the Paris Agreement. 
One key component of the Paris Agreement beyond the NDCs is how uh, the parties will report back on the implementation of the Paris Agreement NDCs. And to do that, uh, the Paris Agreement have created what we call the Enhanced Transparency Framework. This is Article 13 of the Paris Agreement. So basically, uh, in this Enhanced Transparency Framework, all parties of the Paris Agreement will have to provide every two years what we call the Biennial Transparency Report. This report, this document, will include a lot of information uh, in, about the implementation of the NDC, about the greenhouse gas uh, emissions and removals, the GAG national inventories, and many other information. I want to discuss here with you some uh, entry points uh, in the BTR, in the Biennial Transparency Report, that can be used to countries highlight some health uh, adaptation priorities. The first entry point is that when parties report on what are the policies and measures that they have choose to mitigate climate change, to reduce emissions, they can also include as part of the descriptions of these policies and measures, what we call the non-GAG mitigation benefits or co-benefits. And definitely we know that uh, many of the mitigation policies that will reduce uh, greenhouse gases or will remove carbon from the atmosphere, they will have co-benefits that are related to health issues. I will leave to my colleagues in WJO to, to report or to explain those, but uh, I can now give some examples. Once uh, every time we reduce the use of fossil fuels, we're gonna also reduce beyond the GHG emissions other emissions of other gases and, and materials that may, may have uh, impacts on health. Uh, when we uh, work on carbon sequestrations and we plant trees, uh, particularly around the rivers, we will also improve the quality of this water. And the water, if it's used for human consumption, of course, will bring benefits for, for the health as well. So there are many, many benefits, co-benefits, and here through the biannual transparency report, uh, parties will have the opportunity to include these benefits when they describe the policies and measures they choose to mitigate uh, emissions and removals. Next one, please. Oh, sorry, sorry. Before that, also here in the figure, you see uh, links to some uh, documents that have been prepared by H, uh, WHO uh, on exactly the benefit uh, of uh, health of mitigation policies on health. And if I'm not wrong, they have focused the transport sector and the building sector. So I also invite you to download those documents and read because they are very interesting and very good insights on these benefits. Next one, please. Another entry point is that when uh, parties decide to talk about then the adaptation component, not the policies and measures related to mitigation, but the adaptation component of the NDC, they may choose different vehicles to do that. One is what we call the adaptation communication, is a single document uh, that you, of course, as the name says, uh, will describe the adaptation strategy that you have in your country, the vulnerabilities and so on. You can find details of the content of the adaptation communication in decision nine CMA1 that you have the link here in, in this slide. Uh, or the party may choose to not provide an adaptation communication, but to include in the biennial transparency report uh, information on adaptation. And here in chapter four of the annex to decision 18 CMA1, you will find uh, the guidance uh, to uh, prov prov provide this information in the BTR. And finally, you have also the opportunity to provide what we call national adaptation plans. Doesn't matter the, the channel you choose to provide the information. The most important, of course, is the information that you will provide. And if you choose to, uh, I mean, and one thing that I want to stress that is not a mandatory information to be provided. But I'm 100% sure that 
every party will provide this information because not only they had include in the NDCs of the Paris Agreement, but because it's of course a very important topic uh, for the country. So I'm 100% sure that parties will choose one of these uh, vehicles and will provide uh, information on adaptation. It's not mandatory, but it will happen. Also, it's important to clarify that if you choose to provide information in the BTR, uh, this information is not subject to uh, what we call a technical expert review. When we decide the rules of the enhanced transparency framework, particularly the review process of the information, the agreement was that only uh, the greenhouse gas inventory, the information uh, provided to track progress of the NDC mitigation component and the uh, support provided by developed country parties were, was to be subject to a technical expert review. But then some parties, they said, well, we also would like to have the opportunity to have the adaptation information that we provide in our BTR subject to this technical expert review. So now, uh, and we're gonna discuss this a little bit more in detail when I talk about COP27, is uh, this debate or this negotiation on what we call the options to conduct reviews on a voluntary basis of the information reported on the adaptation. And of course, to do that, we also have to have training courses uh, to facilitate these voluntary reviews. Next one, please. So here, maybe uh, to start to, to conclude, uh, what will be the expertise the training need to review health adaptation priority? As I said, I'm not a health uh, expert. So if I participate in the technical expert review of a uh, biennial transparency report, for example, of uh, Uganda, I'll not be able to comment on the adaptation information they provided uh, you know, or the health uh, adaptation priority information they provided. I will focus on the GAG inventory. I will focus on mitigation. That is my area of expertise. So we will have to have within the team, the expert review teams, people with knowledge on adaptation or health uh, aspect in order to be able to, if the country decide to uh, request to this voluntary review of the adaptation information. We know for sure that uh, regardless of your expertise, the technical expert review should not make any political judgment of the information provided. So I cannot say, well, I don't think the, the adaptation uh, information or the priorities that you have set for the adaptation are the right ones for your, for your country. I should not say anything about the government of the country. I have to focus on the technical aspect of such information. And we expect that the feedback that the teams will uh, give to the countries will help them to improve the quality of the information. And of course, maybe sometimes you can also identify the capacity building needs that you, you, the country has to treat that particular component, the adaptation component, or the health adaptation uh, priorities that they have defined. But this needs to be done in conjunction with the, the, the party, the country, in order to not make any kind of interference in the, the, the aspect of the NDC that is naturally determined. So I trust that uh, we're going to have a very good exchange of views and, and experience through the, this uh, technical expert review. And I hope we now in COP27 that we are able to agree on these uh, guidelines for the voluntary review of adaptation information. I hope we can up, uh, came up with training programs uh, to have uh, the necessary people uh, within the teams uh, with adaptation knowledge and some cases health knowledge as well. So when they engage in the voluntary review of adaptation information, they will have, uh, be able to, as I said, exchange views, exchange experience with the country and guide them to provide better information in the future, but without any kind of interference in the nationally determined contribution, of the adaptation priorities and so on. I believe this is my last slide. Uh, Yes, so again, thanks very much. And I'd be happy to, to respond to some questions now or later on also in the, in the debate.
Thank you very much, Marcelo. Indeed, we have now our first Q&A segment. I would like to invite anyone who wishes to ask any questions to Marcelo to raise your hand. Um, please do not hesitate to benefit from his experience. I know the audience is very varied, so uh, if you have any clarification question, don't hesitate. If you want to learn more about some of the aspects, also don't hesitate to ask. Yes, I see the first hand raise the goodwill. Uh, please go ahead. Thank you so much uh, for this opportunity. I don't know if you can get me. Yes, we can hear you well. Okay, I'm Godwill Bate, uh, a PhD fellow on gender and development, focusing on research and also serving with the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial Foundation, LUGMEF Cameroon. We focus on uh, protecting the environment and uh, providing services to pro uh, protect our communities against uh, environmental uh, risks such as climate change. And my question to uh, Motelo is this, what efforts are we doing to respond to the local needs of youths uh, in the area of advancing uh, capacity building in climate change adaptation and health? Thank you, over. Thank you, Goodwill for this question. Marcelo, would you like to um, respond? Sure, sure. Uh, thank you for the question. I will not be able to go uh, in specific examples here now, but as I said, I invite you to read the NDCs of countries and, and you will find there, particularly in the chapter of adaptation, how they are treating uh, adaptation components, including health priorities. And you have a very, a very important uh, aspect that is the involvement of youth in this uh, process. It's up to the countries to, to do that, but there, I know that there are some good examples also in some NDCs that have managed to involve different stakeholders, particularly youth and human or more uh, vulnerable uh, groups and communities. So it's, it's specific to each country, but you will find in the NDCs uh, some uh, information. So uh, please go ahead and maybe you can start by reading the, the NDC of Cameroon, but there are other uh, countries in Africa as well that have uh, this as a, an important aspect. And I know that they have somehow treated uh, not only the adaptation and within adaptation uh, health priorities, and they managed to do that with the involvement of different uh, key stakeholders. Thanks. Thank you, Marcel. I see a second hand raised. Ami, no, Sami, apologies. Anna, please, you have the floor. Can I speak now? Yes, yes, please go ahead. Uh, Sami Hanna from Egypt, about the uh, relationship between uh, the degree of infections, some disease by the climate change. I ask about uh, documents, statics, links, formulas, numbers, not views. Is there uh, something about that? Thank if, you, Sami. Uh, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead, Marcel. Yeah, uh, I think you, you have raised an important point that is more related to statistics and numbers. And of course, I will leave my uh, colleagues on that. HO to, to respond to that. Uh, the documents that I have pointed out maybe has some of the information that you are looking for, but definitely here I foresee there is a gap to come with specific indicators that can be used in the biennial transparency report once you decide to present adaptation information. Uh, if you go to, to the decisions taken in Glasgow, the tables that I have mentioned, those tables were developed to capture information or quantitative information related to mitigation, uh, emissions, uh, emission reductions, and so on. Uh, we have not decided or we have not presented tables that can be used to present adaptation information on a more quantitative manner. 
But I understand that for some countries, it's better to have not only the narrative of what they are doing in terms of adaptation, but to present some numbers indicators. And because adaptation is very dependent on the national and local circumstances, uh, I believe we cannot come to a common agreement or a common table to do that. But I think the, the right approach will have to each country to define their own indicators and then to present this more quantitative information. And maybe uh, UNITAR and others uh, like uh, JBIO can uh, assist the countries in some kind of models or an example of indicators. So this is something that I believe is still to be done. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Marcelo. And, uh, oh. Just to add that there will be also a follow-up presentation, as Marina kindly pointed out from WHO, that will really go deeper into this um, question about climate change and health. And I also invite, as they are already doing WHO colleagues, if they have any relevant links or information they would like to share at this point, of course, to come in. Um, next in line is Gideon. Gideon, I'm sorry for the pronunciation, but please, you have the floor. Thank you, I'm Gideon. Uh... I have a question. I have a question for Marcelo. Uh, in my understanding, uh, what I hear, what I heard, and what uh, I currently taking course is that uh, is it a climatical adaptation plan uh, mitigation in each country uh, may may differ from country to country, like uh, developing countries and developed countries have a different uh, mitigation for their uh, climatic adaptation for health. Uh, so uh, my question is, uh, is the mitigation plan or the, the achievement, is it evaluatable, is it monitored uh, or at the end of the year or at the end of the any months, can it be evaluated? Can it be uh, calculated or put to test? Is there, is there any achievement evaluated? This is uh, my question. Thank you. Thank you, Guido. And, and yes, uh, it can and it will be evaluated. But before uh, going a little bit more in details, let, let me stress here, I think one of the beauties of the Paris Agreement is exactly that each country brings to the table their own contribution, both for mitigation and adaptation. Because countries are different, they have different emission profiles, they have, have different impacts and vulnerabilities. So I think the Paris Agreement has this uh, beauty that allows countries to bring what they want to do, they can do, or they would like to do based on, on support received. But yes, all countries, once they present the NDC, uh, particularly the mitigation component, they will have through the biannual transparency report, the obligation to provide information to track progress in implementing and achieving these NDCs. And they will choose the indicators that are best appropriate to the type of NDC that they have. For the adaptation component, uh, they also have the opportunity, they don't have the, the, the obligation, but they have the opportunity to present information on how the adaptation priorities are being achieved or, or, or not. So we will have this information as well. Uh, at the end, when you reach your uh, NDC end year, then of course we expected that these targets will be met but uh, may happen that some countries will not be able to match the targets, both the mitigation and adaptation. And then we will see what the reasons are. But yes, all of this will be tracked, will be presented, some information will be technically reviewed, and we at the end of the uh, NDC cycles will be able to understand what happens. And we hope, of course, all the targets will be met. And in cases where didn't happen, of course, we will also see information on why it didn't happen. Thank you, Marcelo. We have Davlat, Davlat Saravi. I'm sorry again for the pronunciation. Please, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I have a question on the difference and need to have adaptation as one uh, chapter in the NDCs which is obligatory, as I understand, to all countries, and then to have NAPs or national adaptation plans or even one on health per se, as per WHO. I don't understand the difference. Um, 
um, why do we have it in the NDCs uh, since we are supposed to have NAPs or health NAPs and how far it is obligatory, the NAPs on countries uh, to submit. I understand the NDCs are submitted every five years and they're supposed to be assessed uh, globally, but what about the NAP process and the cycle for submission and review? Thank you. Thank you, thank you for this question. So let me maybe put a little bit of the timeline. The National Adaptation Plan is, uh, was decided even before the uh, Paris Agreement. So it, it was uh, something that uh, under the UNFCCC parties, particularly developing country parties, came and say, well, we want to adapt, we need to adapt to climate change. So let's uh, create here what we call the NAPS, the National Adaptation Plan. That is a voluntary, nobody is obliged to present, but many developing country parties are choosing to present this uh, National uh, Adaptation Plans. And then came the Paris Agreement with this idea of the NDC. And in the beginning, the NDC was just focused on, on mitigation. But again, some countries say, well, look, adaptation is also very important. And I will include, not because you are asking me, but because I want to include this component in my NDC. So uh, when we saw the first NDC coming, I, I would say that 90% or even more of them had the adaptation component, not because it was a request, but because it was a decision of countries. So now we have this situation that you have different places where you can put your adaptation information. As I said, you have the, the, adapt, the NDC, you have the adaptation communication, you have the biennial transparency report, you have the national adaptation plan. Uh, it's up to countries to choose where they put the information. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, we understand or we hope that they all will organize the information in a way that they don't have to repeat the information every, everywhere. And the information can reach the audience, the target that they are aiming for. So we're going to have to see now they, how the countries will play with this all the different options. Uh, none of this information, as I said, it, it needs to be reviewed. There is now the, the, the opportunity, or we are developing the opportunity, a decision in COP27 to allow the voluntary review of the information of the BTR, because some countries want to go through this process. Uh, and finally, you have mentioned a very important uh, topic that is the, the overall assessment of the NDCs in what we call the global stock take. The first one will happen in 2023. And uh, the idea of the global stock take is to assess uh, uh, at the collective level, what is the impact of these different NDCs. And this, again, uh, initially was focused on mitigation, but also because some countries believe adaptation is very important. They are also requesting for a global goal on adaptation. So this is a very important topic of the negotiation out there is to somehow how to define this global goal on adaptation. So also we can assess not only the mitigation component, the qualitative uh, result of the mitigation component of the NDC, but we also will be able to assess globally uh, how adaptation is being uh, dealt with. And this will go through what we now call the global goal on adaptation. That is still under debate, but we hope by 2023, with the first global stock taking, both components, the qualitative goal, the qualitative efforts of mitigation and the qualitative uh, or the global goal on adaptation will be somehow presented and discussed. Thank you very much. Just one uh, logistical note, we take this last uh, hand raised, but we are not able to take any more due to the time constraints. And um, there will be a second segment, as I mentioned later on, to ask further questions. I will also ask our WHO colleagues anytime if they want to complement Marcelo's intervention and answer to please come in, especially now that the question was on the health component of the NAP and so on. Don't hesitate to do so, or even later on during your presentation, of course. Uh, great. So at this point, Naning Pratiwi, um, please you have the floor for your question. Okay. May I speak now? Yes, please. Okay, thank you. I'm interested in this discussion regarding climate change negotiations and health. 
I read on UNCCL Learn website that environmental challenges have an impact on human health. The explanation seems horrific, especially about climate change will cause around 250,000 additional deaths per year between 2030 and 2050. Uh, how to raise awareness about this risk issue to everyone effectively and nicely, especially to young children, because I'm an educator, an elementary teacher. What's more with different environmental situations? What do you think, sir? Uh, maybe my question is easy, but to do the actions is kind of difficult to do so. Thank you. No, th thank you for your question. Uh, I think the, the response to the question is not easy. Uh, and here, I think what I would like to, to suggest is that uh, I think the starting point will be that all these documents that we are producing to the UNFCCC. But maybe more important than the document per se is the process to elaborate these documents. Your national adaptation plan, your adaptation communication, your biennial transparency report, all of these are documents at the end of the day will be the UNFCCC website. But the, the, the process to produce this document for me is critical. And it's where I see the opportunity to engage and to disseminate these uh, issues, not only in few groups, but overall the country and bring to the debate all the key stakeholders, uh, particular young people, women, uh, anyone that is impacted or has a voice in climate change. That basically is everyone in the country. So I think this is what I, I hope countries can, can manage. The process to produce all these documents to the NFCCC is a great opportunity for countries to learn about climate change, to disseminate, to involve everybody and get from them feedback to better prepare these policies and measures and these strategies. So at the end of the day, the document will be there. Sometimes these documents are very heavy, very difficult to read. So this is another issue that uh, I, I, I will talk a little bit more, but the process for me is the most important. And once you have the document, of course, then maybe you cannot give a, 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 an adaptation communication to everyone to read because they will not have the necessary knowledge or capacity to understand what is in there. So once you have a good process, and you have the document, then I think another uh, suggestion here is to kind of translate those documents in a more easy way and different ways that people can understand and can assess the information. The language barrier, for example, uh, all of these documents needs to go to the UNFCCC in one of the six official language. Of course, Portuguese, for example, is not an official language. So uh, I cannot present the NDC of Brazil to everybody in Brazil in English. Nobody or a lot of people will not be able to understand. So here is another idea on how to make this more easy uh, access to, to people. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marcelo. Maybe if I can add, if you allow me to add an ending that uh, uh, you can also refer to the wide range of materials that we offer at the UNCC Learn website. You, you know certainly the e-learning platform, but there is also a knowledge sharing platform. For instance, with the library with 3000 publication from all the UN agencies, including WHO, but also UNESCO in the case of education, UNICEF and so on, on climate change, climate change learning, climate change education. And we really um, try to support the dissemination of this information um, in the classroom as well uh, as in, you know, other uh, settings. Uh, so I hope you will find some information there as well. And my colleagues can share the link yes, there. Thank you for sharing. Um, I see four hand raised and we're um, getting close to the uh, time for yeah. our next presentation. I would suggest, uh, Marcelo, if this works for you, that we ask the four uh, um, participants with a hand raise to share their questions one after the other. And Marcelo, perhaps you could answer at once if that works. Um, Simon, I hope it's correct. Perhaps you yes. <laughs> yes, good yeah. afternoon. Uh, really, I like uh, very much this course, and um, I'm from Mozambique. Uh, really, uh, the topic about climate change uh, nowadays is very, very important because we are we are getting in, in problems because of this uh, the climate changing. Uh, according to the explanation of our of. Uh, 
Mr. Marcelo, I would like to make a question. My question is, uh, according to the problem which is being uh, uh, bringing with the uh, climate changing, for example, in Mozambique, we have got a problem of, uh, of water because there are um, uh, extreme temperatures higher and then it is bringing problems of water. And in this case, many people do not have enough and potable water to drink. And then according to the explanation of our, our Mr. Marcellus, I would like to know how there is a, how can we uh, design or elaborate a plans of adaptation uh, face these problems of uh, climate change, which is bring a big problem in Mozambique. How can we overcome this problem and bring a, a, a correct adaptation plan to, to um, what I can say is to overcome, to be out of these problems? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. This question is well noted. I'd like to invite Marlia Munez again. I hope I'm not mispronouncing too, too badly. Um, for your next question. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm Marlea from the Philippines. Um, I'm interested on safeguards where we have elaborated since Cancun, the meaningful and effective participation of indigenous peoples and local communities. I'd like to hear from uh, our speaker, his observations and views on how this is being focused on so far. Um, there are a lot of reports, but I, I see that there are lesser and lesser space for civic actions, particularly on uh, as regards uh, participation of impoverished communities. Thank you. Thank you very much. And finally, Malika Hamad. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Okay, so actually my name is Malika and I'm in class five as a child. Like I would like to thank UNCC and UNCC learning team uh, that they made a, such an, uh, you know, interactive uh, course for students as in my school, in my class, where students are attracted for them. So thank you very much, UNCC team, for this uh, interactive course. Thank you, thank you very much uh, for your kind words. We are delighted to hear that you use them. Um, yeah, and thanks also to all the other agencies I would like to, to add that contribute to the development of these courses. In this case, WHO and also other UN partners for the other courses you may have seen. So thanks a lot for that. And Marcelo, maybe your final words to answer these final questions. Sure, thanks. Uh, let me start with uh, from the last one, the safeguards. Uh, maybe to those that are not familiar, the safeguards are, as the name says, uh, a set of safeguards that were decided that needs to be uh, go with what is called the RED, uh, reducing okay. emissions from uh, deforestation, reducing emissions from forest degradation, enhancements of carbon stock, and, and sustainable forest management. Uh, red activity is one way that countries have to mitigate climate change. And because there are, particularly when you deal with forest issues, uh, there are concerns around the forest people, communities, uh, together with the decisions of red. Uh, in Cancun, there was this decision about the safeguards. So it's a list of safeguards that countries are supposed to follow when they implement red activities. And of course, within these safeguards, one of some of them are very uh, important or related to the participation, how the consultation process was uh, managed in the country to decide for the red activity, the implementation of red activities, and then how these are being followed uh, through the many years when these red activities will happen. And, and here there is a lot of information about safeguards. Uh, countries are to decide their own safeguards or how to they implement the safeguards. So this is very driven by national circumstances. Uh, we can then offline or, or exchange some ideas or, on some particular aspect. But I, what, what I want to emphasize that I think the safeguard experience 
is a good one that can be used uh, to guide, for example, once the country decide to present adaptation information, uh, including the ones related to health aspect, uh, they are within the safeguard, not all of them, but some of them that I believe uh, are good examples that can be used also to guide the involvement and the participation of people when deciding the adaptation priorities, including health priorities, and then how to follow up on the implementation of them. So I see here uh, a potential learning uh, from the experience of safeguards in the context, uh, more general context of adaptation, including health priorities. I hope these uh, give a little bit of answer to the questions. And then the other one on uh, water, uh, I will not be able, of course, to, to provide a specific answer to the case of Mozambique, but here maybe what I can also give uh, some initial thought is that uh, here I foresee for water uh, possibility of mitigation actions that involve the removal of carbon, particularly in the watershed basins, uh, the opportunity to increase the quantity and quality of water and bringing not only this uh, adaptation co-benefit, uh, also the mitigation benefit of removing the carbon from uh, the atmospheres. And also as part of this uh, adaptation benefit of improving the quantity and the quality of water, we're going to have also the co-benefits of uh, health if people need. And of course, we're going to use this water to drink and to cook and, and so on. So I think it is a good example of when you have one problem that is water quality or water scarcity, and you yeah. choose to have an, a mitigation approach to it that is planting trees in the water sh uh, shed basin. And in doing that, you have all of these co-benefits together, not only moving carbon from the atmosphere, but increasing the quantity of quality of water, and then giving the people that we're going to drink and use the water uh, a better quality of water that will reduce any disease that they may have if the water is not treated or have not the quality, uh, the proper quality. So I think it's a good example. I will not, again, be able to advise uh, more specifically in the case of Mozambique, but it's an approach that at the end of the day, uh, brings many things together. And I think this is the aim here, to focus or to target actions that you may say, well, it's a mitigation action. Yes, but there's a lot of co-benefits uh, on adaptation. Or no, it's an adaptation action. Yeah, but have these mitigation co-benefits for sure. So I think I, I will encourage always to think not only very specifically on one aspect, but to see the big picture uh, of these different actions to be taken. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marcelo, for sharing your views on all uh, these different questions. And thank you very much to all those uh, who participate in this discussion, ask their questions, share their testimonials. Uh, thanks again to Malika for her story and taking the courses. Congratulations on that. At this point, uh, it's time to move to our uh, second uh, um, presentation delivered by WHO. I would like to invite uh, again Marina. Um, to illustrate WHO COP27 priorities on climate change and health and the participation of the health community at the next COP. Thank you, Christina, and thank you, Marcelo, for uh, this incredible uh, overview on all the technicalities of ne negotiations and how the health community can really uh, um, address this important transparency issue at the upcoming COP. What I'm going to present, I'm sharing my V, my screen. Can I double check you see both my screen and you can hear me properly? Uh, we can see your presentation, but it's not full screen yet. No. Now it's, and we can hear you perfectly. Perfect. Thank now you. Now it's full screen? Yes. Perfect. So, um, this is a presentation, as I mentioned before, I'm giving on behalf of the global uh, WHO and health team uh, working on climate change and health in Geneva. But uh, um, I'm, try I'm trying with this presentation really to give you an overview of the connection uh, uh, between climate and health and why WHO is considering uh, 
the climate crisis and health crisis. And uh, this beautiful picture you see from Glasgow last year, I mean, we don't take credit as WHO, this comes from MEDAX, a group of uh, NGOs, uh, um, health experts and advocates. They, they 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 did this action while we were uh, in COP26 last year. We love it. So we are using on our presentation. Just I don't want to take it as a credit for WHO. But for WHO, the climate crisis is an health crisis. And just for your information, we are working on uh, three key areas. Uh, first of all, what we are interested on is to advance climate resilience health. And then we are working on addressing the wide range of health impacts from climate change. And then I heard that you are asking more information about climate impacts. I will give you a little bit more information in this presentation, but I invite you also to look at the online training with UNITAR colleagues. We basically put some effort in giving some background opening uh, information to the training really about highlighted the impacts of climate change on health. Because for maybe for the health community, it's pretty obvious. Maybe it's not for the environmental community. But uh, uh, again, the climate crisis is an health crisis. And uh, then we are strengthening, we are working on strengthening climate resilience and environmental sustainability of health system and, and uh, facilities. I will give you more information about what we are doing on this also during my presentation. And last but not the least, we are really promoting health co-benefits uh, on mitigation action. Uh, and um, well, uh, again, we were uh, just wondering what, why climate and health. Climate change is really undermining uh, key determinants of health and it is increasing diseases and is increasing death. The slide that you see here represents uh, uh, the results of a recent of a recent survey WHO uh, did with uh, national health uh, um, uh, authorities. And then as, as you can see, uh, most of uh, 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 most of the, uh, our answer goes with the, um, water. I mean, we were talking about water impact of climate change on uh, uh, water uh, food diseases and increase of injuries and death due to extreme weather events, airborne and respiratory diseases, especially linked to indoor and outdoor. Uh, um, pollution, which is uh, very much connected to climate change, both that are coming for the same cause, the uh, burning of fossil fuel and the use of unsustainable energy, heat waves and uh, not, non, non communicable diseases, malnutrition and mental health. Anyway, these are the results uh, from our internal uh, survey with national health authorities, the Ministry of Health, but then uh, Oops, my, okay. But this is exactly what also the IPCC and for the people I see from the poll that many from, from, from many of you in this call uh, and this webinar are from the environmental side. So I'm sure most of you are familiar with these acronyms just in case you never heard it before, the Environmental Panel on Climate Change, which is the most authoritative and uh, the, 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 the key uh, scientific body that is really bringing together all the knowledge, evidence and science about climate change. And in the recent report, the Secret Set 20 report, there is a special chapter on uh, climate change and health. And as you can see, uh, there is an increased impact on health and one being again associated to the same uh, uh, issue uh, we, we, we saw in, on our uh, survey. Uh, infectious diseases, malnutrition, mental health, and displacement. But here in this presentation, again, I heard that you would love to hear more about the connection between climate change and health. Uh, uh, there is a lot more on, uh, on the online training again, but you can also refer to all our publication online. Um, and then my, I'm sure my colleagues that are in the in the in the meeting in the webinar will probably will suggest a few readings while I'm talking for you to go deeper in, in the aspect of climate change and health. But what I would love to 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 do here because we're approaching COP27, this webinar is about uh, negotiations. I would love to tell you more about what WHO is doing in the context of uh, climate negotiation, big uh, events, and then and so uh, most. First of all, why we as WHO we are going to these COPs? COPs uh, again, I'm sure you all know, but just uh, to go to, to take out all doubts are uh, the conference of parties, or min mainly Ministry of Environment gathering for every year since 27 years as the number. <laughs> 
tells us trying to really um, uh, cut emission and control uh, the global warming and, and, and reduce the negative uh, catastrophic effects that uh, we know are already happening and they're projected to be even worse. So what we do as WHO, we try to uh, increase health influence, I mean, health, the health message in the negotiations. We're doing this through like supporting the participation of national health representative in national delegation, strengthening our advocacy work with NGOs, UN, the academia. And we really want to bring together also uh, the health message to come across uh, uh, all sectors and uh, and highlight the, uh, the importance of adapting and re building resilience, but also the importance of raising awareness about the important co-benefit. Everything we do on climate uh, for the health community generates a health benefit. If you reduce emission in transport uh, by sus promoting sustainable mobility, and you provide you 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 are basically asking people to move to 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 do physical activities. You're reducing cardiovascular diseases. If you are uh, reinvesting investing in renewable energy, cutting down fossil fuel, you are reducing uh, um, air air pollution, and you are tackling a huge big health agenda, which is the seven million deaths every year because of uh, air pollution, premature death, and many others like agriculture and uh, investing on sustainable agriculture, sustainable diets. Um, anyway, I don't want to go too much again on the details of the reason why we promote co-benefit. We'll tell you more in this uh, uh, presentation. And again, uh, you see, you find more in the UNITAR uh, uh, online training. So basically what we do, we engage with negotiations. We organize big events. We organize training as this one we are having together. And then for, since two COPs, we are uh, investing time, energy, and a uh, lot of enthusiasm on building uh, our own space uh, with an health pavilion. This year in particular, um, we are collaborating with the COP presidency. As you know, is, uh, the COP is happening, happening in Sharm el-Sheikh in Egypt. And the COP presidency is putting specific uh, focus on gender, women's health, nutrition, nutrition. We are working with the uh, government of Egypt on a special uh, initiative to link climate, health and nutrition. Uh, youth, I, I heard the question about youth. Uh, we are working a lot uh, with. Uh, I'm very, I'm very, I'm very happy uh, to 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 inform whoever is not aware that for the first time ever in the history of COP, this presidency has uh, nominated a uh, youth envoy, envoy, and uh, uh, she is uh, Omnia Omnia um, a, a, a money. Uh, she is a former IFMSA. IFMSA is the International Federation of Medical Student Association. Omnia is very close uh, uh, um, uh, uh, colleague, partner of us. We've been engaging as WHO with the International Federation of Medical Students for many, many years. It's the way we raise awareness uh, uh, about health and climate with youth, with future medical uh, uh, and public health students. And um, so I uh, will tell you more about what we're doing with youth, but for people interested to engage more youth, feel free to approach the presidency and the special envoy. They're really putting an emphasis on how really to communicate climate through, through the future generation. And then uh, cities and uh, there is a special initiative on CC we are contributing to uh, science. Uh, there is a sign, okay, we don't have an health day at this COP, but we have a science day with several uh, uh, climate change and health talks. Anyway, I don't want to go into many details here. Our stakeholder engagement goes from, from uh, the member states to NGOs, academia, and private sector when we are allowed to speak to them. But, uh, and, Opla. So, and for your information, we are preparing for the upcoming negotiation series of uh, uh, science and policy brief to really uh, uh, raise important health connection with ongoing negotiating streams. I just put down in this slide the key issue we are working on. We, are, we will very will be very happy to share with all of you the detailed brief. Uh, and all the people that are taking the training will receive also the updates. We had, we haven't shared it yet because they are under finalization. I would love to send you the final version, but then if you are interested to learn more about IPCC evidence, 
on climate change health and health. We have a dedicated brief for you coming soon. Also, uh, we are preparing one on uh, um, SLCP, short-lived climate pollutants uh, and air pollution. Loss and damage is one of the key issues that will be raised at this COP, and we will uh, provide the health perspective on loss and damage. And um, Marcelo mentioned the important exercise that we are going to do next year on global stock take. We are preparing the health position on global stock take, food system and agriculture. Uh, and as I mentioned before, we will have a special initiatives on nutrition. And then we have a special position paper on health, uh, climate and intergenerational equity. Again, responding to the question about how to engage youth. All this material will be available for you, will be shared with you. Uh, and, and then I want just to remind that we are working a lot with energy and water uh, community. And then for uh, people that are not aware, the government of Egypt has, they did not put yet a special emphasis on health per se, but they, they are clearly stating that the key priority for this COP, apart from finance, raising finance for the for, for least developed country and adaptation and loss and damage, is to raise the issue about energy, water, and nutrition. And, and all this for us, it's about health. And um, so oh, we feel like this COP is going to be an health COP. And other things we are doing at COP is a special high level event uh, to present our new alliance on transformative action on climate change and health, so, so called ATTACH. ATTACH is a WHO led initiative that uh, uh, has been set up in collaboration uh, uh, with the UK and Egypt to implement the so called COP26 health commitments. I just want to give you a quick overview of what his health commitments um, at COP26 were. This is, oops, this is very, very important. Last year, the uh, COP presidency UK, for the first time ever, did uh, um, put an emphasis on, on the health sector and raise uh, four in, in, in important initiatives, one on climate resilience health system, one on health leadership in emission reduction, and uh, promotion of healthy NDCs, a big campaign really bringing uh, uh, attention on the importance of including health in the national thermic contributions that uh, uh, Marcelo uh, uh, eloquently and very detailed uh, explained to us before. And then the mobilizing the health voice from climate action. So it was a big advocacy campaign from the health community. We had more than 45 million um, healthcare uh, professional signing a special letter to Alok Sharma, the co-president, asking to put again health at the focus of the negotiation. But out of these initiatives, as I mentioned before, WHO collected uh, um, a special commitment for country wanted to invest on building climate resilient healthcare uh, system and facilities. And we have more than 60 country committing. Just want to also with this slide, sorry, I'm start running a little bit because I see time is, uh, um, is passing and I understand we want also to have more open uh, uh, question and answer. So sorry if I'm accelerating a little bit, I will be happy to go back to this information if I had, uh, has come through too, too quickly. But I wanted to emphasize also the reason why we are as WHO working on building sustainable low carbon uh, facility is the, the understanding and the uh, realization that as a sector, the health sector, we are our, we are impacted, of course, by climate change, but we are also a big emitter. 4.5% uh, uh, of global uh, greenhouse gases emission are indeed uh, from the uh, health uh, care sector. So, and then we, we know that 70% of this uh, global footprint of the sector comes from the supply chain. So we are really committed and engaged uh, uh, not only to promote uh, adaptation resilience, but also to take the leadership in reducing our carbon footprint. And then we do work uh, with country. We have a dedicated WHO guidance, uh, if you're interested, and it's part of the, the material references uh, that you find on the online training. We have a dedicated WHO guidance uh, for climate resilience and environmentally sustainable healthcare facility. If there are people in this uh, training course uh, from the health sector, feel free to come back to us if you want to learn more. Even if you are not from the health sector, you want to understand better how to engage with the health uh, 
sector. Just very quickly on the COP, uh, just if you wonder also what did this country committed to on, under this attach? What country committed to undertake a climate change and health vulnerability and adaptation assessment, both a population and health care? Uh, level to develop the health national adaptation plan uh, uh, informed by the VNA, the vulnerability adaptation assessment, uh, to use VNA and and the and the H NAPS uh, to 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 facilitate access uh, health access to climate change uh, funding. And in fact, in these commitments, we also have uh, not only a big country uh, uh, from uh, least developed from from a low income country uh, um, commitment but we also have high emission higher emitters uh, higher income country uh, uh, commitments uh, to set up targets uh, that uh, will bring down uh, to zero emission the health their health system ideally by 2020 and also country uh, donor country to commit on providing more funding uh, uh, to 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 health adaptation and and, and resilience building but then if you Again, if you're interested in this initiative, feel free uh, to consult the training manual. There are all reference to details and, and additional information it can be asked always also to our team. And very briefly, again, on attach, because it's a very important alliance for us, bringing together key state, um, uh, uh, stakeholder like country, development agency, technical expert, uh, uh, um, multilateral development banks, NGOs. And we are working together really on four main uh, aspects of uh, uh, climate resilience and uh, of the health sector. So climate resilience, decarbonization of the health sector, finance, bringing more finance and uh, reduce the uh, uh, footprint of the uh, supply chain. Then the other big activities we do to go uh, prior to COP is the training for health professional. And these, uh, uh, the, 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 the online, course that we developed with UNITA was initially intended to really serve the scope of training health professionals that are interested to understand uh, climate change negotiations. But then we thought about opening to everybody because it's true that health professionals need to understand the negotiations, but negotiators, environmental uh, uh, people, they need to understand why in the negotiations we should have health. So the super beautiful uh, online training prepared by our colleague from UNITA really give give you an, uh, an overview of from really climate change and health connection to the history of climate uh, uh, change negotiations and the opportunity to really address health within the negotiations. Um, and, uh, and Christina already provided this overview and you you know that in the in the latest um, version of the of the course available to you, uh, you find also detailed information on how to address health at the upcoming uh, COP27. So I would say this train is really uh, future looking and already anticipating uh, your engagement. If you are, and it will be uh, for your information also, and information I want to share with you. Thanks to like our collaboration with Welcome Trust, uh, we have uh, in WHO some funding available to uh, support representative of Ministry of Health. I just want to give uh, false uh, uh, hope. I saw many of you uh, uh, are not coming to COP and some wrote in the chat, I would like to come. So this is not for you to jump on the <laughs> opportunity and apply to for funding to come to COP. It's only, but we do have some availability for sponsoring Ministry of Health representative from Afro and from Middle East. And um, so uh, if you are on this category representative of Ministry of Health and you actually interested, you're taking the training course, you, you think you can join your delegation and you really want to raise awareness about health, please contact us because we may help you really maybe making it from financial point of view. But then of course you need to be accredited by your own uh, national delegation as a, a official uh, negotiators. It's not just to come to attend the COP, it's really to come and negotiate with your delegation. And then, so as I mentioned before, we are spending a lot of time and energy <laughs> and, and sleeping hours on the preparation of this big space uh, dedicated to health talks, uh, uh, the COP27 Health Pavilion, which is uh, has received uh, more than 200 uh, applications for side event. We just selected only 40, unfortunately. We don't have... Uh, I mean, neither the time, uh, um, not this lot for, 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 for 
to 200, but then this 40, they are super uh, interesting events uh, to address the health argument uh, for ambitious climate action across many different sectors. Uh, you can see the program is already online. If my colleague Alexandra, she's with, still with us, I'm sure she will post on the chat a link where you can find the information about uh, the health pavilion. What I wanted to tell you, just because it's something new and uh, we're getting super proud about this, that uh, we are using this year the pavilion to bring some art to remind about the important connection between health and climate and why we need to put climate really at the center of these negotiations. The piece of art we are bringing and will be installed in the pavilion is a, a, a gigantic uh, lens, uh, two lens uh, that are basically, uh, um, uh, it's, a, it's a sculpture cast in aluminum uh, from a real trees also to kind of show the connection between nature climate, air pollution, and health. And then it's produced by a group of artists in, called Invisible Flop. And then we are very lucky to have Welcome Trust uh, supporting and sponsoring this. Is yeah, it's just art. Well, it's important uh, maybe also to change the way we communicate and to have something visually impactful. And we all really hope our pavilion will bring the message, just the shape will bring really the message that we, we wish to bring to COP. But uh, again, on, on youth, and then there was a question about how uh, uh, we can engage youth in the climate change and health uh, um, dialogue. In, indeed, in collaboration with the Medical Federation, the International Federation of Medical Students and the Global Alliance of Climate Change and Health, and with the support of the co-presidency, the Youth Envoy and the Ministry of Health and Education, we are running for the first time a global forum on uh, uh, health and climate change. It unfortunately happened already. There are two sessions already happened online last weekend, but we are planning to have also uh, an open high level dialogue with youth and intergenerational dialogue at the, um, directly at the, at the COP in Sharm Sheikh. If you didn't, you missed this. Uh, 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 the first two days of the forum, they were intended to be some kind of training for health for 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 young people to understand the health and, and climate linkage. Uh, um, I would suggest to visit our webpage. We will upload uh, the recording soon. And then, if you are coming to COP, please don't miss the in-person meeting we will organize there. So just to conclude, uh, also we go to COP with key messaging. Last year we had published something uh, very powerful, we believe is very powerful, is a summary of the, all the reason why the health community is engaged in climate change. You find a lot of evidence and statistics that you have been asking uh, before in the Q&A. It's called the Health Argument for Climate Action. We are not republishing, it was a special report uh, uh, that we are not republishing because I'm afraid we didn't, our key message, uh, of course, they went through, but uh, as, as you know, in climate change, you don't have to reinvent the message, the message is there. So we are not republishing, or, but we are reusing, reusing the key message that we brought last year to COP26. Uh, we bring it to COP27. I will actually maybe not go through all of them again in the interest of time and to leave more time for a potential last question and answer. You can have a look at the key message and then uh, also at the report and come back to us for any question. I just wanted to close by informing that another, but this is really just out of curiosity, and is also the reason why our uh, team leader is not with us in this uh, webinar. We are like promoting uh, and also another alternative uh, communication campaign with a group of pediatricians that are cycling, leaving tomorrow uh, uh, from Geneva and going through Italy up to Naples and meeting or other, other health professional in a pediatric hospital to raise awareness and bring the important message that we need to invest on climate change and health and uh, reduce air pollution for future generation for children. So they are all trying to reach uh, Sharm el Sheikh cycling, but then uh, between Naples in Italy and, and um, and Egypt, uh, there are no sheep and there are no ferry. And we even tried with Greenpeace uh, to see whether they were uh, like coming with their own warrior boat, nothing. So I don't know the cyclists if we stay in Naples so we'll continue with us in Sharm el Sheikh. But this was just, uh, 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 yes, and our boss, uh, um, Jarmi is joining them and uh, we are very proud and we'll do some, uh, 
a series of blogs and uh, and key connection with the, the, the doctor cycling and telling and speaking about health and climate connection. You can see this on our web page, uh, WHO web page, follow the cyclists and the uh, and the nice talks about health and climate. Okay, over. I think I, I super overdue and the time is really uh, yeah, against us. Uh, over back to you, Christina. Thank you very much, Marina, for this great presentation. I enjoyed really a lot. I was super impressive to see all the activities that WHO is doing to promote health across so many streams of negotiations and topics related to climate change, from transport to loss and damage. Uh, impressive. And also, of course, all the activities you're organizing for COP. Um, very interesting. I'll stop here because uh, I imagine there are lots of questions from our participants. I know we are actually running out of time, but Marina, if you still have a bit of time to answer some questions, perhaps we can take a few of them. Yes, Christina, it's my fault because I ran over, uh, but I also have another meeting to continue to prepare all these activities I just uh, uh, presented. So five minutes extra. I five say. minutes extra. Perfect. Now, it was also our fault because we had a lot of questions during the previous uh, Q&A. I see four questions. Perhaps we can take these four questions so far. And then if there are other questions, they could be shared in the chat and we'll follow up afterwards. So maybe Kiao? Hello. Hello. Yeah, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Uh, I, I would like to thank you for firstly, thank you for your presentation, Maria. And I would like to uh, ask and discuss about uh, your uh, presentation. Uh, you present the, the health sector produced the CO2 in previous years, uh, especially from the supply chain sector. Uh, as my previous research, uh, during the COVID-19 period, uh, we had uh, we, we can make the unbalanced uh, CO2 emission during this and the other pollu pollution like uh, uh, fish, sea waste and other food waste. Uh, I would like to ask, uh, is there any model for future the pandemic uh, about the climate change? Because uh, in previous COVID-19 situation, we can control and uh, focus on the climate change impact about the pollution of the uh, healthcare waste, uh, like uh, such as the uh, face mask, facial mask, and the uh, uh, single use uh, plastic waste. Uh, we we must use uh, everyone use uh, previous uh, during the previous uh, pandemic situation. So in future the any pandemic can be begun. Uh, I'm not sure, but the, it can be possible. So for the future, if there are any the global scale model for the future pandemic situation to maintain the climate change issues. Because uh, previous year ago, we, we focused on the CO2 emission and we try to reduce the CO2 emission. But uh, within these two years, we can uh, focus and emphasize on this issue. We bring it to the, our head. So th that is my question. Okay, I don't know, Christina, you want to take more or just answer one by one? As you wish, maybe if we don't have a lot of time, I can go ahead and- Maybe uh, maybe super quickly on this one, if okay. I understand correctly. And then I think I agree and the percent we should also look at uh, like beyond CO2 emission, the connection with nature, conservation of biodiversity, nature-based solution for climate. And uh, because we have seen, we have, we have seen through the pandemics uh, when we break the connection with nature, when we we don't do enough surveillance, and when we 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 destroy nature, uh, I mean there are uh, we enter into connection with things that uh, yeah, generate diseases that we. Is, 
it's uh, it's uh, uh, yeah it's difficult to manage after all so a lot of uh, additional investment is going from who side on surveillance and, and prevention on conservation of biodiversity looking at the different aspects between climate biodiversity connection between uh, climate solution and nature based solution so yes uh, you are absolutely right and we need to i mean look at co2 but also the overall interaction with uh, nature and environment thank you marina mukta would you like to go next uh yes i'm mukta from india i have a concern uh the latest news says that even unborn babies are having pollutants in their brains lungs and liver it is really concerning because if this goes on the human health will deteriorate a lot uh, i question this because after the lockdown I think pollution was, uh, uh, I think it was reduced uh, for huge amounts, but still, but then uh, this problem is going on. I, I don't know how to um, explain it. I mean, how can we even tackle this problem because it is really concerning the human health. So uh, how can we spread awareness about this? How can we educate people about this? That um, I think people should know about this, right? Uh, babies are even... Uh, uh having problems even before they are born Yes, no, Mukta, super uh, important uh, question. And as I tried to mention in my brief uh, presentation, for us, the connection between air pollution, climate change, and health is fundamental. Like air pollution is coming 70% and more. Uh, of the uh, of the causes of air pollution are basically the same of climate change is the burning of fossil fuel and the use of sustainable energy sources and then as you know who statistics tells us that seven million people are dying prematurely and then it's not only lungs but as you say brain and heart is uh, all the cardiovascular diseases are impacted by exposure to air pollution in india unfortunately your country is one of the most affected but what you can do, uh, it's a lot, there is a lot of awareness and uh, advocacy going on in India. And we are super lucky to have at our health pavilion because we have this lung shape. And then uh, we want to speak a lot about air pollution impact. And we have a doctor from India, and you may know him already, Dr. Kumar, Alvin Kumar, who uh, has, has set up an NGO school, is is a pneumologist himself, is really a clinical doctor, but then he also do a lot of advocacy. He set up uh, his own NGO school, uh, Doctor for Cleaner. And then uh, yeah, I would suggest that you look uh, for his contact. And if you want, we can put in contact as well. And then uh, join this movement. It's not only him. There are many more uh, that we are aware of in India, but then, uh, they're putting a lot of pressure on local uh, uh, authorities, on mayors, on at the national level, on, on your ministries of environment. But yes, it's a huge, big issue. And uh, uh, I think what we like to say is the youth and their engagement uh, will be the solution. Their pressure, uh, you are, a vote, you are uh, voting as well. The politician needs to hear from, 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 from you. Uh, so I would just say there are no solutions, but there is this hope in engaging and pushing and uh, pressuring your policymaker and politician. And happy to share more uh, information, maybe bilaterally, if you like. Oh. Thank you. We have only two minutes left, so perhaps I'll ask Sami, Philip, Hendrix to briefly share your questions, and then Marina can give a final answer. Um, before we conclude, maybe Sami, could you briefly share your question? Okay, it's not a question. I uh, need to request two, two things. The first is to uh, repeat this, uh, this webinar or meeting or make many webinars or making. It was very useful if uh, it was possible to every month or every two months. The second from you, NCC, is to make more courses in Arabic. There are uh, more than 300 million Arabic. Uh, the majority of them don't know English. I want you to uh, increase the Arabic lessons. Thank you. Thank you, Sami. That's all well noted. Um, Thank you, Sami. And can I apologize on behalf of WHO? We were planning to do a, a, an, an Arabic translation, 
But um, yeah, we've been lucky with Unita colleague to to make it to add these activities to the long list of things we are preparing for COP. We didn't manage to recruit uh, interpreters. Um, we tried; they were not available uh, in short time. But you're completely right. Uh, we need to invest more on multilingualism and especially yeah, Arabic. Thank you, and thank you for for the interest. And definitely, we'll organize more. Uh, in the future, more of these talks. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Philippe? Can, can, can I be heard? Yes, now yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Philip. First uh, and foremost, I would like to thank uh, the, the whole team for, for putting uh, together this such an intellectual appealing of presentation. Uh, I'm a police officer by professional. Uh, I'm from Namibia. And my, my question lies uh, at the stage like where I, 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 I want to ask, uh, since Namibia is a coastal country, and most of the time coastal countries are the ones who are actually uh, suffering from, 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 the, uh, from the outcomes of climate change. We are talking about uh, the, the, the South Pole uh, being melted down because of, of the uh, uh, of the global uh, increase, uh, is it not possible, like, to criminalize uh, uh, acts that are uh, demeaning to the to the environment when it comes to, to, to climate change, so that uh, we can uh, the people really take it the serious thing, especially like I'm talking, I'm talking like in in, in a, a like from my from my from my like in Namibia, the people don't really understand the effect that the climate change has. So, is it possible that maybe uh, discussions of this nature can be actually like uh, trying to, 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 to the COP 2017, I mean, so and criminalize the activities that are related to, to, to climate change? Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Philip. And I love your proposal to criminalize who is not uh, uh, committing to protect the environment. Uh, and I fully agree with you. I'm, a, I'm afraid it's not only in Namibia; it's really everywhere. I think, you know, in different way, uh, uh, we are all polluting this beautiful world. And uh, yes, and there actually there are lots of a group of NGOs now bringing, trying to bring their own um, government uh, to court. Uh, and uh, and so the open litigation action against the, the politician that they they committed to take uh, uh, action in COP uh, uh, now is like COP uh, 15. What was it? Uh, um, no, sorry, 15, 21. In the Paris Agreement, where Marcelo told us the Paris Agreement was uh, agreed. And they commit to reduce emission. They commit, committed to implement national uh, uh, laws and action to uh, reduce emission, protect the environment. They didn't do it. A lot of citizens around the world are now raising uh, 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 up and then bringing their own government to court. Um, so definitely, there is a movement of uh, people trying to legalize. Uh, I mean, at least to 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 criminalize the, the who is not. Uh, responding to, to climate commitment. But yeah, no, definitely, uh, um, and it's great that it comes from a police, uh, this, uh, the, this idea. And uh, specifically on OCEAN, we will, uh, the COP, this COP will have also special uh, dialogues on uh, the pollution uh, and, and climate impact uh, 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 from OCEAN. And then we, in our health pavilion, we have several dedicated discussion on the biodiversity day. Again, if you look at the program, and I forgot to mention our pavilion in COP will be hybrid, meaning that even if you are not coming to COP, but you want to follow the dialogue and the, the talks, uh, you can connect remotely and listen in. So I invite all of you to, to, to join us online as well and follow all the talks that are more interesting for you. But thank you very much. And maybe you can initiate a movement of a police officer for climate. Uh, it would be nice uh, uh, to legalize the implementation of, yeah, of environmental commitment. Over. Thank you. We have the last questions. Hendrix, if you would like to ask that. Uh, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes. 
Okay, I'm Hendricks from Minister of Health, uh, responsible for human health and climate change. Uh, actually, uh, thank you for organizing this meeting, which is very touching. Uh, what I have is not a question, but it's a, a, a word of encouragement that I was one of the participants who attended COP26 in Glasgow, and it was very interesting. And I, what I wanted to aid for those who are going to attend the participate in the COP27, they have to be very committed, they have to showcase, they have to bring touching issues from the country, specific on health and climate change, so that indeed the health negotiators during the COP27, we should achieve a recognition that indeed health, the impact of health should be recognized in the, all the COP across the country under UNFCC so that the health initiative, which have been prioritized through them, should be taken on board across the global world. So it's a matter of encouragement that indeed, let's go there, the people are going. Go there with commitment, dedication, and indeed stand for health negotiators so that we move the health initiative, which have been prioritized by the WHO. Thank you. Thank you, Hendrix. Actually, this is the best way to close with your words of encouragement, and you really just gave the best concluding remarks. Uh, so I hand, hand over to Christina and um, thank you so much to all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hendrix. I also think that's the perfect conclusion for our meeting. I would like to thank Marcelo and Marina for staying 20 minutes longer in our meeting to allow for all these questions to be answered. And thank you very much, all of you, for being with us today. Um, please uh, check the course uh, if you haven't done yet. You will find more information there, including the links to many presentations. And we hope to be in touch with you again soon in the future. Thank you very much and have a good day, uh, good evening. <laughs>